Alrighty, thank you all so much for joining us online this evening as we had to move to a Zoom only event tonight for the Brisbane launch of Bridie Jabour's book, Trivial Grievances. Um, firstly, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which I'm currently on, the Yogara and Turrbal people, um, as well as the traditional owners of the lands in which you're all joining us from on Zoom tonight. I pay my respects to elders past and present. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, for our audience tonight, you will be muted for the, the entire session, but you can have your video on. Um, if you do have any questions, please just type them into the chat box. Once I've finished my little introduction, I will send you through the link where you can purchase your copy of Trivial Grievances. And this will also show you how you can use the chat function, which will be very important for our Q&A that will commence around 7.15 or 7.20. So please type your questions into the chat box throughout, and then I will pass them along to Bridie towards the end. And also just make sure your settings are on speaker view so you'll be able to see Bridie and Kat full screen. So in conversation we, uh, tonight, we have Kat Feeney. Kat has been a journalist and columnist for more than a decade, covering all aspects of news across multiple storytelling platforms, print, online, television, and radio. At the moment, you can join her every weekday from 12.30 p.m. on ABC Radio Brisbane and Queensland. Take it away, Kat. Awesome. Thank you so much, Yana, and hello to everybody who is here. Uh, great to have you along, and I'd like to as well extend my respects to the First Nations people who are the original storytellers. And here we are this afternoon, well, this evening, celebrating uh, a new story from one of our favourite authors and one of my favourite people on this whole entire planet. That is Bridie K. Jabour. Bridie K., hello. Hello. You look so great. Um, you. Cat, oh Cat, Kate, we've <laughs> got such a great professional setup there. And look, like I am literally locked in my room away from my awful children. Fortress <laughs> Friday in the bedroom. And I'm trying to scope the titles of the books that you have on the bed rest. That's always very interesting. I know I couldn't um, even put up like good. Uh, get your good product product ones. No, it's up just what I want to read next. There's just like <laughs> an IRA book, stuff like that. That's the usual. So I suppose what's great that um, I want to get out there up front with everyone here tonight is that Bridie and I uh, have a bit of a relationship that extends to when we first met at the Brisbane Times. And I can't even remember the particular year. But the fact is that I was writing about sex and fashion. Bridie came along writing about news and really clever, interesting pieces. Uh, and we became mates. Uh, we chuffed along in Brizzy for a while, Bridie, and then you, like just about everybody else, decided to answer the call of the bright lights at the big smoke down in Sydney. So off you went, uh, working with The Guardian, journalism, um, editing uh, through the press gallery in Canberra, and a book that we loved, The Way Things Should Be by Bridie Jabour. Here you are with Trivial Grievances, which came out... Um, off the back of a really successful essay that you wrote for The Guardian. Um, just remind us about the point you were trying to make in that essay and how it applies to millennials and what it's got to do with misery, Bridie. Well, it actually came off, uh, off the back of a dinner in Brisbane, which I am still obviously very fond of after living there for a couple of years. And it was with a group of um, women that I used to know there but it's also it, uh, but there were a couple of dinners I had it was pretty funny one of my mates texted me thinking it was her dinner and she got really excited about it so I think that goes to show how many conversations were being similar conversations were being had around the time but basically I just realized that a lot of my mates in their early 30s were feeling like they'd hit a big slump or a big wall in their life and they were looking around and it didn't matter where they were in life whether some of them had great jobs some of them were still going between jobs. Some of them were already mothers. Some of them very, very single. Um, and it wasn't all women. It was men as well. And I even noticed it in my mates in the Northern Hemisphere, it just seemed no matter where they were in life, they were looking around and thinking, is this it? Is this the life that I've got? Have I, have I made the right decisions? And what it was was a good old-fashioned existential crisis which can happen at any, any age. But because I saw so many people having it around 31, I thought, oh, there's probably a piece in this. And I, it was coming up to Christmas, New Year. 
in um in Australia when we traditionally run some lighter pieces, pieces that aren't tied to the news cycle, pieces that are just about life. And I asked another editor, what do you reckon of this idea? Because I just I can't just commission myself as much as I would love to make the Guardian opinion section, just a list of things that I think. <laughs> That'd be fine. Um, We'd be fine with that, but anyway. I asked the, another editor, what do you reckon about this? And she said, yeah, yeah, that's a piece, write it. And um, so I just wrote it for the quiet uh, Christmas New Year period, which didn't end up being that quiet because it, the bushfires were on, but I, it went up on New Year's Eve in the morning and, you know, very, very quiet time. And so I thought, you know, it's just basically filler for the site, like interesting filler, but filler for the site. I uh, didn't really think much of it after it was published. Woke up the next day, more than 600,000 clicks around the world. Mm-hmm. It was nuts. I had interview requests from New York. I had interview requests from England, people telling me that had been sent around all their group chats overseas, people in Sydney writing to me, people in country North Queensland writing to me. It was like mm-hmm. really, really struck a chord, uh, which really shocked me. Like I thought there was something in the atmosphere. I wasn't making it up, but I didn't realise like how universal this feeling was. And um, I'd just been shopping around my second novel and it had been rejected by every single publisher. <laughs> Yeah, I had about 30,000 words. It was fine. Like I wasn't crushed, you know, it was a bit disappointing, but you know, those, it, that's how it goes in publishing. So I thought, I thought that I would only ever write fiction when it came to books and I chopped around the novel and they'd all said no. And then after this piece, you know, I was thinking a lot about it and life. And then my agent said to me, it was her idea. Why don't you write nonfiction mm-hmm. based on this piece? Cause she knew it had gone. No, so I had to think about it. And, um, yeah, obviously thought there was enough there, did a book pitch. It really wasn't that long, the pitch, and got a deal with Harper Collins, which was dream dream stuff off the back of it. So, yeah, and that, so that's how it, and then by that time it was February 2020. Mm. I thought, cool, like all the bushfires had been raging over the summer and it had been really, really hectic at work and just really hectic in general because mm. I, we couldn't breathe properly. All de- everyone down the East Coast knows how that felt. And then... um. So I thought, oh, it's February 2020. Life's finally calming down. The news is finally calming down. <laughs> I'm going. How wrong you were! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's interesting because in the in the book, I mean, and you do deal with the pandemic, which kind of looms large over us right now, and especially over you because here you are in Sydney today, where the lockdown has been extended and this is why we can't enjoy your company here in Brisbane um and I'm kind of wondering whether doing a book launch via zoom qualifies as a trivial grievance just quickly I feel like I'm playing some kind of weird pandemic bingo because I've had a baby basically in lockdown and now I've had a book come out in lockdown (laughs) so I'm hitting like all those like bigger stories that people have about the things in their life that have been effed up because of Hmm. the pandemic but baby, healthy and happy. Birth ended up being fine. Hmm. Happy this book is out. Yeah, I can't. Like I had, I allowed myself one little meltdown as a treat. Yeah, that's allowed. No more yeah. after that. But to the idea that you kind of are making a point that the sort of millennials are, are coming out of what you describe as the best of times and the worst of times. Um, in a way, this is a book that allows us as a reader to contemplate the pandemic or contemplate some of the other serious grievances that we have and you do really make a point about the difference between a trivial grievance and a grievance that is more substantial but that you're allowed to feel upset or angry about your circumstances and indeed that's never more pronounced than when you feel like you are losing control of your circumstances many of us are feeling like we've lost control at the moment or we can't control the things that are around us. But Bridie, you, um, in addition to everything that you've just mentioned and you reference it in the book, you've been through a couple of pretty harrowing experiences where you really did lose control. Um, As a parent, you want to control the entire environment of your child and your child's every move and outcome. But you had a moment where it was pretty touch and go with your son Hamish and then I had to text you just last week because you wrote a piece about a car crash that you were in that I didn't even know about so how has that impacted your perspective and I guess how do you feel that informs the message of trivial grievances well I think uh so the first the first brush with mortality um more my child's mortality 
that I had was a seizure, which I write about in the book when he was 14 months old. And I really think that that changed me fundamentally as a person, as a mother, certainly, uh, and is an experience that really informs the whole book. And I don't think the book would be the book it became without that seizure. Uh, and what happened, he was 14 months old. We were at home. Um, he's had no issues and he uh, had a seizure. Um, my brother is a nurse and he was there at the time. And just, I just froze. And my brother was like, well, actually I started screaming, shame is shame is my brother's name. And he ran out of the kitchen and saw him. And he said, call triple O. I had to be told. I always thought that I would take better action than that, but he had to tell me to do it. And when I rang triple O, Hamish started to turn blue and my brother had him in like the position that he needed to be in and stuff. And he was yelling at him, um, Ham, stay with us. Ham, stay with us. And when I heard him yell that, I thought, that we were losing him. I thought that, yeah, my kid was dying and I didn't know why. And it, it had happened absolutely out of nowhere. Then the, the lady on Triple Low was very calm because that is her job. But also she's heard it a million times before and it's actually not a serious thing. But man, little kids are just little freaks. Like we don't know why COVID doesn't affect them so badly. There's so much stuff we don't know about kids medically and they are little medical freaks. We don't know why COVID doesn't affect them. We don't know why they have these seizures when their temperatures go up and then they just grow out of it. It does apparently doesn't affect their brain or anything, but that's what it was. And when the ambulance men, when we were in the, like the ambulance came and because it's his first seizure and stuff, like they suspect that it's from the temperature thing, but they still come and take you to hospital and you have to do all these tests. And the ambulance men said they were super calm and they told me in the ambulance that they go to those kinds of seizures and they have to treat the parents before they treat the kid because the parents are like so hysterical and need to be sedated. And once the seizure finishes, it's actually quite an extraordinary thing to witness. It will finish. And once it finishes, they just go straight to sleep. And like, it's really like, it, it's a freaky thing, mm. but even though he was fine and obviously I knew he was fine after that terror, I felt in that moment when he was turning blue and I was on the phone to triple O and my brother was yelling, like saying to him, stay with us. It just never left me really. And I, I, you know, brushed up against my kids' mortality. I think that, that I did have a belief deep down inside that my kid was immortal. As stupid mm. as that sounds. I did, like, I, I had not really considered that something that terrible could happen to him. Then it almost did. And even though it turned out to be fine, I'd already had the feeling that it, that it had been the worst outcome. And after that, definitely made me more of an anxious mother. I've never been able to be as relaxed and cool as I was before that moment about him. And that was um, a year and a half ago now. And, but it made me, I think, a better, I don't want to say better person because that's really twee, but it, it, I think it started to make me a bit better at life and thinking about life and thinking about my priorities. You know, I'm a pretty driven, ambitious person. I think that that is fairly self-evident, obviously. Um, you don't write a book and have a baby in a freaking pandemic unless you have some right. of my kind of drive. But uh, I don't like work is not the center of my life anymore. And I really did do a big shifting of my priorities. And I think it also made it easier for me to enjoy my kid day by day as well. Like mm -hmm. when you're being taken out of yourself in that kind of way, once you come back to it, um, it, you know, there's a big kind of euphoria that wears off in the first fortnight, but still I kept with me for a long time, that feeling of, um, just appreciating every moment or like moments of appreciation, daily moments of appreciation when things are really good, when something is really beautiful or, you know, when my, my kid is being sweet. Mm -hmm. And then I think that very much informed. It's why I was thinking about. Uh-oh, Bridie. Be too productive, why we don't have to achieve. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, <laughs> you're back. Sorry, did I drop out? Oh, Momentarily. Happen again. You were having uh, a anyway. profound thought. It added to the dramatic okay. aspect of it. When did I drop out? What did I say? You were saying you were having a moment. So I think you might have been either segueing into an aspect of the book or. I'm yeah, wondering. it just informed what I wrote. It informed yeah. basically that feeling and that realization it ended up informing the entire book, which is about we don't need to be too productive. We shouldn't make work the center of our life. What is the meaning of our lives and how do you live a good and fulfilled and ultimately like joyous, ordinary mm -hmm. life?
Yeah. And I don't even think that was conscious when I set out the book to write it, but looking back on it and looking at the book, I see that that experience informed it a lot. Okay. So just a reminder as well, that we'll be taking questions uh, from you for Bridie a little later during the sesh. So making sure that you're keeping a track of some of the things that pop into your brain as they pop into your brain. So you can put them to Bridie uh, at about a quarter past seven. So I want to take a moment to talk about what you've just said, Bridie, but I do want to come back to the car crash because I just want to process that with you. And I think it only adds weight to the ultimate message of the book that we're talking about tonight. But you sort of said that you had this moment with your son and you realized that work wasn't the center of your world. And you examine that in great detail in the book. Do you feel that millennials have made a mistake, that we've aligned our identities too much with, our work and is that really our fault given that you know we're living in a world where it's so much harder to find an education that our parents had for free or it's so much harder to get a foot in the property market so we kind of we have to work so if we've made a mistake of aligning our identity with work is that really our own fault no yeah I don't think I think that a lot of people at our age do get an identity from work. If not an identity, they think that there's something moral about working hard or there's moral value in work and that it can make you a better person if you work hard and work all the time and work often. But it is also something that has very much been forced upon us by, you guessed it, capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry, I'm not going to make it a lecture about that. But there is definitely less of the, it, there used to be such a clear demarcation between our work time mm. and our leisure time. And I think there's very few people these days who get to leave work at 4.30, 5 p.m. and not have to take any phone calls, not to have to answer any emails or not have to be thinking on the weekend about things to set up for their week of work. Or even if they manage not to do that stuff, not to be thinking about work and stressing a little bit about work. So I think, it, yeah, it's pretty twofold there. People do get their identity from it and think there's more value in it, in working hard. And we've been told that a lot, but also just forced upon us because there's no yeah no clear line between our work and leisure and even to the point where a lot of people take the things they enjoy and hobbies and feel a need to make it a side hustle rather than just something they enjoy doing to pass the time mm. yeah it's so interesting I read that and I thought how curious Catholic Friday talking about Protestant work ethic on the backdrop of capitalism this is going to be <laughs> a great conversation um and before we get to this crash let's talk about religion because you do deal with it in the book and a comment that is made often is that we've lost religion and a belief structure and this in some way explain, explains the ennui that a lot of millennials feel or the disconnection we feel from community and so on. Now, obviously, it's not as simple as that. And I'm not saying that as a view that you uphold. But given that you were raised Catholic, and I'd like you to describe exactly what that means uh, for people who don't know what being raised Irish Catholic means. Um, what is your sense of the role that religious belief, whatever the religion, could play or should play in the life of a millennial today? So I think in the book, the way that I describe it, I was raised Irish Catholic by a mother uh, from Derry. And being Irish Catholic as compared to being like Australian Catholic is like a toddler compared to Roger Federer. You know, the toddler really lacks the full body commitment. And that's Australian Catholics to me in general. <laughs> Whereas my Irish Catholic mother, you know, I went to mass every single Sunday until I left home. And then often weeks, way more than that. My mother goes to mass every single day. We used to do decades of the rosary after dinner and on weekly nights. Like it was a huge, huge part of my life. And, uh, you know, even when I was 18 and I took, because I turned 18 in year 12 when I was still living at home, it still wasn't a conversation about whether I got to go to mass or not. If I was out partying the night before, I would have to meet my mother at mass. It doesn't, didn't matter what state I was in at 9.30 that morning. I was there every morning at 9.30, stinking of ciggies and beer <laughs> for much of the last half of that year. <laughs> so it was a huge part of my life, and but I drifted pretty easily from it after turning 18, but it's still a huge part of my mother's life and a huge part of my extended 
family as well. And so I think I can understand the comfort it brings. I can understand why people follow it. And I'm still not, I'm still not an atheist. No way. I don't think that someone like me could ever be an atheist, like a full mm. atheist. No. So, um, but also like Irish Catholics have this like spooky kind of superstitious spirituality and that I'm definitely into like go surreal. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, kind of on that point and, and again, to the question about the role that a religious belief or let's take away religion and add to it belief system um, plays in the lives of millennials, you uh, open pretty early on with uh, a new system of beliefs that you carry. And I'm only doing that not to den- degenerate the um, denigrate the system of beliefs, but that you kind of believe, but you don't believe, but you believe. Um, and I'm talking about yeah, astrology. You know. <laughs> so um, I want to get to your point about astrology and the and the role that it's starting to play perhaps in your view in the lives of millennials. But have you looked at your stars today? Because I have, if you haven't. Which So I read my um, chart each month. So but uh-huh. which astrologist did you use? Because it very much depends on the astrologist. I mean, I just went to internet for your stars. <laughs> So is that, is there, there are varying degrees. Okay. Oh, I follow a very specific, two very specific astrologists, but that's fine. I would take <laughs> your internet daily horoscope. Well, according to your daily internet horoscope uh, today as a Gemini bright age of boar. Um, and by the way, I didn't realize that this was the description of Gemini is that you're playful, but you have resolves. True. Uh, that you're soft hearted. Also true. And there's a a lot of expression of that in the book with your devotion to a, a woman that you encounter on the streets of Sydney, um, that you express yourself effectively unless you're talking about your feelings. <laughs> See, <laughs> astrology real. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that your stars for today reveal that the detractors that you've been dealing with will be proved false. Uh, your boss or someone of high authority will realise that you were right all along and you will attract a new love interest. So how's that panning out so far? Is that? Oh, my God. Can you imagine <laughs> Lenore Taylor thinking that I was right? <laughs> well, I don't disagree with anything she says, though. <laughs> she is always right. That's a very funny star sign. Um, discuss astrology and you, Bridie. Astrology and millennials. And what role does it play in alleviating the misery that millennials well, I may think astrology so. I don't think it's a replacement for religion. I don't think that people who follow astrology, millennials who follow astrology are as serious or devoted about it as people are about religion and all the rituals around that. I just think that astrology is something that you can, um, I think quite a few people really do believe in it or half believe in it and pretend that they're doing it ironically, which is, I guess, very of the times and of the internet that we're experiencing. But I also think that astrology is like, an easy way for people to talk about themselves when without them feeling like they're being too self-indulgent because they can put up this barrier between them and the behaviors or the actions like you know I was um, like I find it hard to talk about my articulate my feelings properly because I'm a Gemini you're saying and Geminis also think this and they also do this when actually what you're saying is I think this and I do that but I don't actually really know why I am the way I am and you know I go to um, a tarot card reader and it's on like therapy and that's where I got the idea that this is all just ways for young people a lot of other people are into it as well but people in their 30s to discuss themselves in a heart in a kind of non-ironic way and take themselves a bit seriously but all while pretending that they're believing in something separate but I so I don't think it gives them the same structures and community that religion has for other people in the past so it's not a full-on replacement and doesn't have as much devotion but it is super fun and that is super fun. frequently true sometimes. It, it also <laughs> says um, that someone you will meet today will change your life. So that could happen. I met nobody today. I'm in fucking lockdown. At a quarter past <laughs> seven. Here we all are. Someone here, oh, yeah. right Where now. Is someone here tonight. <laughs> could change your life. So no pressure, guys, with the questions for Bridie. But, you know, it's in the stars. Could be you. Um, <laughs> um, so, Bridie, let's talk about uh what happened with your family in the car so we were going up to north queensland to see my husband's parents because um thanks anastasia we hadn't seen him for a year (laughs) and they hadn't met my baby yet uh 
we were on the highway between the Bruce Highway between Townsville, just north of Townsville, and a semi trailer hit us from behind and the in a hundred zone, and the car flipped three times. Um, I was in the back between my two kids. My husband was driving and we were all completely conscious for the entire thing. I put an arm out in front of each of my children. Didn't pick a favorite. And um, and I was just, you know, it, it dead set happened in slow motion. You know, that thing is true. And I know that that's actually a science of how you recall a memory, but how it felt was slow motion because I knew, I didn't know the truck had hit us, but I knew we were rolling. And I just thought, don't, don't roll again, don't roll again. And we rolled again, I thought, don't roll again, don't roll again. And we, we ended up rolling three times. And the triple O call uh, from bystanders that went through was a car hit in a hundred zone by a truck, rolled three times. So they dispatched two road ambulances and a helicopter because almost all of the time in a situa situation like that, at least one, if not, all people in the car do not walk away from it. And we all walked away. The, the extent of injuries between my kids was a cut on the big toe of my baby. And that was it. And when we, they, the kids were pulled out of the car, there was shattered windscreen all over one of the child seats, but still somehow my kids didn't end up injured from that. They were both fine. There was an off-duty paramedic who pulled my kid, she came to the window and I said, call an ambulance, call an ambulance. Like, obviously I was in shock. And she said, I'm off duty paramedic. I said, get my kids out. She said, I'll get your kids out. And she checked them and got them out. And I was last out of the car and I had a broken shoulder, which I didn't realize at the time, but obviously I knew it was sore. Um, and so I was pulled out of the car because I couldn't climb out myself. Um, I had to cut a baby seat and get me out. And when I got out, I just faced this woman, this off duty paramedic. And I couldn't look at anything else. And I was like, are my kids okay? She said, they're okay. I said, are my kids okay? She said, they're okay. And I just asked her just over and over again. I just could not believe it. And she's like, they're right there. She was obviously really patient about it, but it was just crazy. And then we were um, taken. And when the road ambos got there, they couldn't believe it that how, you know, we all had to get taken to hospital for some x-rays and observations because of the seriousness of the accident, but they couldn't believe already that we were all conscious and seemed fine. And um, then they called off the helicopter one of, the, one of the road ambos was like, do you want to ride in a chopper? And I'm like, no, what are you talking about? I'm like, ah, it's just been hit by a truck. <laughs> so we went to hospital um, and there were doctors and nurses, multiple doctors and nurses who came to our room to meet us at, because they just, it just never happens. They just never, ever, ever see an accident like that where people walk away the way that we walked away. It was incredible. It is incredible. And I'm really glad that, everything worked out the way it did so that we're here with you tonight that you're with your family tonight I mean when you stop and think about it it's really quite a well an enormous moment you were talking earlier about um having a brush with your son's mortality and this is the mortality of your entire family Bridie yeah it was the euphoria that I had for the two weeks after was nuts. I, I was, I felt high. Like, I guess that is all of the adrenaline wearing off and the shock wearing off. But my other, my mate who's been in a near death experience in New York messaged me about it. And I said, God, I just feel so high. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I remember the feeling like it does wear off eventually, but it's a very common occurrence in near death experiences. But one of the doctors who came to visit us said, um, you know, one, your whole family could have been wiped out. And then he said, or at least one of you. And that was just much more horrifying to me. One of us thinking of one of us going rather than just all of us, because I don't, you know, I don't care if I'm dead. If I died, I wouldn't care because I'd be dead, but it's losing someone else in the family. Yeah. My whole life could have been over as I know it. And then somehow we all just walked away. All I had was a broken shoulder. Mm. Family is a really big uh well, part of your life and a big aspect in the book and it's something that you deal with in relation to the broader idea of um, misery and millennials obviously at the moment there are lots of families that are unable to be with each other and lots of families that have experienced a lot of loss and hardship um, circumstances that might have been there before the pandemic that may have been exacerbated because of the pandemic um, you, you talk a lot about how 
your own identity may be defined or influenced or shaped by your family. Um, I'm wondering if you could perhaps expand on that a little bit and especially the point about how maybe it's the way your siblings relate to you rather than the way you were parented that could influence your identity and therefore the shape of your life and trajectory and do you have a favorite sibling Bridie? Everyone everyone has a favorite but it's not set in stone it changes <laughs> all the time and my siblings and I are so blatant about our favorites we rank each other <laughs> <laughs> and let each other know it keeps us on our toes very I healthy subscribe to that newsletter yeah go very, on very healthy I'm sure <laughs> um my mom she used she has like these coasters of us with each of our faces on them and she fully stacks them in the order of what of which one's her favorite to her least favorite of the moment and so you could go to a house and then someone would text me like one of my sisters would text me and be like what have you done you're at the bottom of the stack and I'll be like oh we had a fight two weeks ago and I haven't called her since and um and then when my son was born Hamish she put the coasters in a cupboard because she was so done with her own kids and the <laughs> <favorites."> <laughs> and Hamish just took the number one position <laughs> then daylight then the rest of us Anyway, so yeah, that's how my family is about favorites. Um, I would say my favorite at the moment might be. Oh, well, you're actually me. answering the question. I oh, was yeah. just that yeah, was a joke. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's probably my middle sister. Okay. I just feel closer at the moment. Um, but yeah, in the book, I make the point, or I write about how I think the borders of my life, the borders of my life, are very made, made up with my relationships with other people and my relationships to other people. Mm -hmm. um, my family, my husband, my kids, my siblings, my friends, uh, my extended family of cousins, even, you know, even some of my colleagues, I would have super close relationships with them. I've always loved people. And I think that is, it is one of the reasons that I am, you know, a pretty content person overall with some, I like to think uh, perspective some of the time. Uh, and I don't get too carried away with myself or, um, you know, thinking too much about myself, I think. And I think it's because of all those relationships. But yeah, I wrote this essay. It's one of my favorite essays in the book about whether like, does the way you were parented matter when you have siblings? Or is it your siblings that influence the person that you are and shape the person that you are? Because there's a huge amount of literature as any parent or especially any millennial parent knows. There's a huge amount of literature out there on how best to parent your kids and raise your kids so they become you know, uh, good, empathetic, loving, secure, productive probably as well, people are hoping. Um, well, I don't care if my own kids are productive <laughs> members of society. Um, but there's not that much around there. So it puts a lot of obviously emphasis on the parents, a lot of blame at times on the parents. There's not, and I've always thought, you know, I feel so much more influenced by my siblings and my relationship with them. There's four of us. I'm the eldest. There's six years between me and the youngest. So it's just like, bam, 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 all of us. We're ba basically knowing each other our entire lives for as long as we can remember. I remember a little bit before my younger sister was born, but not much. And I think that the way that we interacted with each other and built relationships with each other and fought with each other, conflict resolution, I think it's hugely informed the person I am and how much I was able to boss them around. And they did what I said. Hmm. I have probably built a lot of my confidence from that. And I, when I started looking at the research in it, it's not a very well-researched area, but the studies do show that I am onto something there and that your sibling can definitely be a big influence on you. So yeah, it was something that I, I've been wanting to explore for ages and it's been hmm. great because even though my book has only been out for a month, uh, for a month, for a week. Fuck, it's felt like a month because it's lockdown. It's been out for a week. Um, <laughs> I've already had a few of my mates message me specifically about that essay and that chapter. Mm -hmm. So that's been great that it's been something that people have noticed as well. Well, I guess my response to it, and this will not come as a surprise to you um, as a friend, was, well, I have one sister and you and I have very different childhood experiences. And I'm the parent of an only child. You're a mother of two. And when we look at family size in Australia, the number of children is reducing. 
So I'm wondering what you think that might mean for future generations if there are more children in Australia now being born without siblings. I know it's a good question. I don't think it's a negative thing not to have siblings, but I do think that even only children are going to be influenced by more than their parents. Mm -hmm. I think you form really close friendships or like if you're lucky, you have cousins as well. And so, because I think the broader point of my essay was like, it goes so much beyond the way that you were parented. And that was the finding of the studies as well, was that people have the same parents. So they found that parents usually parent their kids really similar, but you can't really control who their classmates are, who they end up hanging out with and all those different kinds of environmental factors. So I don't think it's huge, it's a negative, but I certainly just think that in these smaller families, they find different people to be in, influenced by. So I've got to make sure that my kids' friends are super cool. <laughs> I don't right, care. Pressure. One or the other. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Your kids can play with my kid. It's fine. That's cool. Yes, exactly. um, so, so then you also included a chapter about, well, two actually, about children. The argument for and the argument against. Why was it important for you to include that in the book, Brady? I guess that my kids are just something that I think a lot about. And the book was very much a series of things that have been on my mind in the past few years. And so I did one that is reasons to have children. And then another, which was reasons not to have children, because I certainly didn't want to, even though I obviously chose to have them myself, I certainly didn't, didn't want to paint it as uh, the best option for everyone, because it's not the best option for everyone. And so the reasons to have children is very much written from my perspective and my experiences and reasons not to have children. Well, I had to interview a lot of people for that and, and find out their reasons. And it was so interesting, I thought, because certainly before I started that, I thought that the main, main reasons people didn't have children were like moral reasons, I guess, like them saying that they're bad for the planet or... Um, you know, the environmental reasons or, you know, we're overpopulated anyway, or, you know, sometimes they can't afford it, which didn't turn out to be the uh, facts at all. Like the reasons that most, and I interviewed demographers for this as well, the reasons that most people who don't have children don't have children who choose it is simply because they don't want to have children which was really interesting to me and really interesting to explore in my interviews with those people. But I, I included those chapters as well because it's pretty much one of the biggest decisions you'll ever make in life. Your life is going to be hugely different if you have children, completely transformed. And your life is going to be hugely different if you don't have children as well. It's like one of those few decisions where it really matters which option you take. You can't just like ignore it or flake out of it. So it's always a fascinating discussion to me. Hmm. And I suppose given that you're considering life in your 30s, there are all of those other associated pressures with uh, biology and children and uh, how that comes to bear. So this brings us to almost the end of my leading of questions. So guys, just remember, if you've got questions for Bridie, get ready on the chat box because we'll be throwing to you uh, through Yana in a moment. But I would be hugely impressed if there's questions. Oh, come on. It's Brisbane. We're, I know they've got to do it. That's what we do. We're doing well. You're like, don't, be, don't be shy. You want to wait too long, me, don't you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you, you've kind of identified a lot of um, themes that um, millennials these days are living with that might account for or explain uh, the the misery that you wrote about originally in, in that Guardian essay. But you do, toward the end of the book, offer some hope, <laughs> and you alluded to it earlier, um, some ideas about how to like your life, which I really responded well to, as opposed to it being Bridie's Guide to Happiness. Um, I like that you instead shifted focus to make it more about liking your life because that's really quite empowering. And this whole push towards having to be happy is just frankly exhausting and beyond the scope of so many people. Why did you decide to focus those chapter, that chapter more about liking your life rather than being happy? Well, because I don't have advice on for people on how to be happy. Like that would be pretending that I have all of the answers, which I definitely do not. But you are a happy and content person. 
I am a happy and content person, but I can't tell people, but I'm happy and content because of specific circumstances in my life, because I have like my specific son, singular, which one, which one is the one that makes me happy? (laughs) Because I have my specific children and my specific partner and, you know, you can't have my specific parents. And and I feel like those things are such a huge part of my, my happiness and general contentness. So I don't feel like I have it. I have any sound advice for a guide to happiness, but I think that I could help people try to, I guess, find the joy in their ordinary lives. And I've I've got a very ordinary life as well, and there's so much joy in it. So I think that if you can look for those small joys, sometimes even make them daily joys, and I think it can be hugely transformative. And also, I just don't want to put pressure on people. People don't have to be happy. It's very inappropriate and an unnatural thing to be happy all of the time. Mm, yeah, definitely. And I, and I think as well, like as some of the earlier chapters, um, uh, they deal with that idea of um, the, the great power that uh, fear has in people's lives. And maybe that fear manifests in a state of constantly needing to strive or achieve or be better than or compare yourself with other people so you make all of this excellent um well all of these excellent points about calming down chilling out look for the simple joys but then you say you're happy to be addicted to your phone and a lot of people would say that instagram spending time on phones looking at all the pretty pictures that only fuels a sense of unhappiness yeah I don't agree with that (laughs) yeah so come on spell it out go I just uh, look I think that it's become very uh a very lazy way for it to be covered by the media and I think that social media can definitely exacerbate people's unhappiness and uh, dissatisfaction with their own lives but I don't think it's the beginning of their unhappiness or the beginning of their dissatisfaction with their lives I also think that if by the time you get to your thirties and you look at social media and think that it's real um, and honest, you haven't been paying much attention. (laughs) And so I just like, I just enjoy all the good bits on my phone. And also I think when studies come out saying phone use like causes depression and the world is ending because of it, it's always really interesting to me that it just says phone use and never actually what you're doing on your phone, because I think that it's very different to be watching conspiracy theories on YouTube is very different to be to reading. Well, maybe it's not that different to reading long form on the New York times, <laughs> but it's different. Like it's different to reading really interesting long magazine articles. It's different to chatting to your friends all the time in group chats. Um, it's different to keeping in touch with family and friends overseas. And I think as long as you're not getting your sense of self from social media and online, then a hugely positive thing I think because of my phone without my phone I would have had um like a much much more lonely time in the first few months of both of my kids births I think that it has added to the sum of my knowledge in a good way like there are a lot of stupid memes in my head as well that I don't need to be retaining but I've also learned a lot from it and so yeah I just want to push back against that narrative that like you know phones are the reason that we're all unhappy or the reason society is falling apart when really I think the reason a lot of people are unhappy is because we've felt that like pullback from community and being siloed off more because of mm-hmm. work, a lot because of work. But yeah, so that's why I wrote that to push back against that idea. I oh, I like being addicted to my phone. Yeah, that's cool. So I'm going to write, I wrote you a letter just saying recently, an old fashioned letter. So that was nice. Yeah, it was good. It was gorgeous. But I can't write you a letter back because my writing is a freaking preschool scrawl. Uh, and you you're so beautiful. Your penmanship is so beautiful. It's humiliating to me to read. <laughs> uh, we, we're gonna thank you. Um, I try. I try too hard. So we're gonna take questions uh from you guys in a moment. Just make sure you're popping them in the chat box. Uh, but Bridie, before we get to that, um, so much of what you ask us to consider in this book is the idea of identity and how we define ourselves. And you ask a lot of questions, you know, am I shaped by, like, is my identity shaped by the influence of my parents or uh, the way my siblings see me or the conversations or the company that I keep with friends? 
um, the type of lipstick that I use, the skincare regime that I follow, the money that I have, the postcode they live in, you know, there's a part of that that I wonder, like, is, is that exacerbated by living in a place like Sydney where things are extremely competitive and maybe operating at a very different level to what you might experience if you're a millennial in Gympie? And could you also then maybe give us a sense of how you see yourself? now at the end of this book with the near-death experiences that you've had i mean how do you define bridey jabor uh as a crack wizard <laughs> <laughs> a loose unit no crack as in no it's an old <laughs> Irish yeah, not as in like the drug crack right um, just clarifying that no, no, no that's a joke uh <laughs> I think like, do you mean like, do you think I have all these big existential questions about what I define myself by because I'm in a pretty high pressure job in a pretty high pressure city? I just wondered to what extent that um, influences because when we're looking at some of the, the data that's coming out um, and we're about due to do the census, so that'll bring us a, a fresh perspective, but we are so aware that there is a big shift away from metropolitan areas to regional parts of Australia. And this, especially by young people. And in, in some ways that supports your kind of churn and burn theory that millennials are just exhausted by the intense competition that happens a lot, not exclusively, but a lot in major capital cities. And here you are in Sydney in the most competitive city in the entire country of Australia. So do you feel those pressures really, really keenly? And would you be the same person if you say move back to Brisbane with all of us? I'm just, you know, <laughs> would you be a better person, maybe? <laughs> maybe I should <laughs> move back to Brisbane. <laughs> no, am I being obvious? Maybe it's my dream to move to the Gulf. <laughs> I, um, I think I would be a different, I would certainly be a different person if I lived in Brisbane or if I lived in Coolangatta, which is my dream. But I would also be a different person if I lived in New York. Like you're, of course, shaped by your environment and where you are. And I think that um, while... I don't I think that a like a teenager in Gympie can have the same kind of ex, a 31 year old in Gympie can have the same sort of existential crisis and think why am I here um maybe not articulating those exact words like what is the meaning of life am I happy with those choices I think that can happen to anyone anywhere um maybe slightly exacerbated for by where I am in the environment I mean but I also think that you know I don't find it too punishing to be here or too competitive I think that maybe in my 20s I was striving a lot more and cared a lot more then, but I don't think that I do so much anymore. And if I would, would I be happier leaving Sydney? I think that maybe I would be happier and everyone would be happier if they had a bit more leisure time and time for themselves and time to spend with their family. So mm. I think that is really key. May not, may, maybe not necessarily exactly the job that you work or and or, or the city that you live in and also I guess the flip of that is if you don't feel financial pressures and that's a huge relief so a place like a place like Sydney could be very very difficult for someone on a, less money than me so that also plays into it as well what you can afford yeah it's a good question I think it's a hard one for me to answer if I would be happier away from here or if the pressures here have exacerbated it I certainly obviously have something within myself that that, that is driven and still ambitious, even though I do want to step back from making work the center of my life or something that mm. defines me. And I think I have become a lot better at that. Yeah. Righto. Well, I mean, if you're thinking about Brisbane, I'd want to get in the market now because it's starting to get a little competitive. Um, we are, <laughs> we're going to now ask you guys to jump on in with your own questions. Trust me, I have plenty more and I've nearly finished a glass of champagne. So, you know, who knows where we could end up next. And I'm um, a lot of this. Maybe I'll <laughs> Woo! Um, I just wanted to say though, Bridie, the book is tremendous and I'll save my accolades for the very end. But Yana, have we got some questions from the floor? We sure do. We've had a few coming in and we'll kick off with a nice kind of short one or it could be long. But um, Stephanie says, tell us about the stunning book cover um, and the hilarious versions that people are recreating. <laughs> Great question. Oh, my God. So this book cover, isn't it like the best book cover that you have all ever seen in your life? It's I amazing. love it. 
And I, yeah, when it got sent to me, so uh, on my last book and with other authors that I know, you, they usually get sent like a few different covers or a few different options. That is the only cover that was sent to me because even when my publisher saw that cover, she was just like, this is brilliant and amazing. Uh, the person who designed it is Andy Warren. It was through the very clever and dynamic HarperCollins design studio. And he he read the book and I, when I mean him, I really want to ask him if he Googled me because I feel like the woman, like to see what I look like because the, I feel like the woman in the cover is definitely not me, but she has like my vibes. <laughs> Oh, she's got, you've got like the same lip color on. Yeah. Yeah. Like and right so she, now. And she's got my vibes and he, and I did message him about it, like saying, thank you. And it's so brilliant. And I love it. And um, he said he loved the book and yeah, just after he read the book, he went away and uh, thought about it and that's what he came up with. And I think that that is, that cover is like something kind of a little bit ironic uh, in a way, which I guess my book is in some parts, even though it's trying very hard to be self-aware and a little bit funny and um, and just a little bit cool and also like hard to define, which I think that the book in itself is actually a hard to define book because it does go across a lot of different areas. So yeah, that's how the book cover came up and I love it. We all, it, we all love it. Mm. So have people been recreating it as well, stacking the pillows? On oh my it? God, yes. So this started, I think that this is actually lockdown brain. <laughs> but people my, mates very Sydney, in lockdown. my beautiful mates in Sydney who I love, um, who are also a bit nutty got their covers of the book and then like one recreated the most perfect recreation of it like with three pillows tied around it looks so funny another mate only had the white glasses and then another girl tried to do it and she did a disaster one where she just couldn't pull it off and then Daisy Turnbull who I'm friends with did a great recreation of it as well so it's sort of like become a thing but it's only people in Sydney. So I do think it's just like a crazy lockdown brain thing that people do. <laughs> so who knows, maybe my Melbourne, like Melbourne readers will be next and it'll be my Insta feed. Oh yeah, they're going to be getting a little kooky soon, I can imagine. Um, we've got another question. I'll try to get through as many as I can. We do have a lot coming in actually. Um, one from Shay. She wants to know who your favourite astrologers are and is one of them Mystic Medusa? No, but I'm definitely going to be Googling that after because Shay already sounds like, she knows what she's talking about. So Susan Miller, uh, astrology, astrologyzone.com, which is a super, super famous astrologist and astrologist to the stars, does a great monthly uh, horoscope for everyone. She is my absolute favorite and my go-to. And I've been convinced that she predicted like pregnancies, job promotions, my mate, like meeting her boyfriend. We're very, there's a group of us very devoted. And also Serna, who is a chick who's S-R-N-A, verse on Melbourne in on Instagram um she's a chick in Melbourne I think it's quite young I think maybe about my age and yeah she does great horoscopes as well so those are my two main astrologers great I'll be looking those ones up right after we're done here um we've got a question coming in from Steph she says Bridie I love the book especially the chapters on not letting work define you one thing I was left thinking about afterwards was how much pressure there is to be happy how we're falling how we're failing if we're not happy our parents and grandparents generations had a lot of extended tough periods which are often the moments they talk about the most I wonder why we're so unwilling to accept unhappiness and what you think about about moments of and what you think about how moments of unhappiness build a life yeah I think that moments of unhappiness are completely essential to life because if you were happy all of the time it would be a very unnatural thing and you would never change anything about your life so you need to go through moments of unhappiness to change your life and you need your life to change for it to be interesting and to move on to the next thing so yeah I think they're hugely transformative and important experiences Hopefully we're all going to get a lot out of the last 18 months, eh? <laughs> <laughs> but um, what was the other part of that question? Oh, why are we so unwilling to accept unhappiness? I think that we sometimes, especially in your early 30s, uh, speaking of grandparents and parents, you can look back on them and think that they were in very different stages of life to what we are in and were able to secure have a stable job and have families. It seems like it was easier for them back then. They had their families, they had their stable jobs and they were able to get housing. And I think that we, if you get to your early thirties, uh, I think you can feel a little bit like you're being left behind or you're falling behind or not living up to what your parents and grandparents were able to do and maybe took a bit for granted. So I don't think that we're that bad at accepting unhappiness, but I think that 
we're maybe just a bit confused as to why we're like this at this age and at this stage. Yeah, and I think what you were saying about content, being content and then being happy, I think there's the pressure to be happy all the time, but I think it's more being content <laughs> to be kind of the base level. Yeah. Um, we've got a question from Rhiannon, and she says, full disclosure, I haven't read the book yet, but getting back to millennials and astrology and stoicism, all these things that our generation have really taken to, do you think we're looking for the kind of cultural shorthand that would have previously been filled by other community identifiers, such as religion? It feels like so, many, so, so much of the unhappiness my friends have experienced comes in part from a thirst to be seen. Yeah. Uh, one... It's absolutely fine. You haven't read my book yet. It's only been out for a week. That's <laughs> you're meant to come to this if you haven't read my book and then be so inspired that you buy it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that a lot of the um, I I don't know. It's astrology is a thing people are looking to to replace religion, but I think that what people have lost in their life, the broader proper population in general, when they lose religion, and many of us have, is community. And something to build your community around. And I think that's the thing that's really missing from a lot of people's lives because with religion, yes, comes a very comforting belief in God and a set of structures to live by, to be a good person, which is nice and reassuring to have. But it's also somewhere to go every Sunday where you see the same people, you see your friends, you see your neighbours, and then you usually hang out together after. And I think that that is what is missing from a lot of people's lives. And I think that that is why, you know, we, when we were talking a bit before about phones being blamed for unhappiness, it's not that. It's people going off into their own little individual silos and not feeling part of something bigger anymore, whether that is a neighbourhood um, or a school or even your workplace. And obviously the pandemic has only made that worse. But I think that's the core of people's unhappiness, feeling cut off from each other and alone and lonely rather than part of a community and something bigger than them, which religion provided, but other things can provide. Mm. Um, we will also jump to a question from Justine. And she's wondering, did you talk to anyone perhaps a bit older than us who has successfully deprogrammed or come out of the other side of this existential crisis? Or is it just one of those things that requires a constant effort forever? You know, I don't want to depress you too much, but the older, people I, forever. the older people that I talked to about this said it's just something that keeps on happening forever <laughs> until you die. But the good news is you go through periods of contentment and happiness and you get past that existential crisis. But then, yeah, a new one looms on the horizon. And a woman in her 50s, an incredibly successful woman in her 50s, who I know a little bit, messaged me after reading a bit of the book and she said your book is so right she's like that's exactly how I felt at 31 I had a huge panic about all my responsibilities and then she's like and then 41 and then 51 and she's like it was deadening and she's like in every decade it was on the one birthday not the zero birthday so I think that it might just questioning it all and trying to find meaning might just be a part of the human condition forever great news it's forever <laughs> Um, we might have time for one more question. Um, this one's from Ruben. And he says, my brother and I are both in our mid thirties, aside from coming from a low social economic background, we are both eternal procrastinators. We often talk about the perception that you generally do your life's work in your thirties. Both he and I are only just starting to figure out what our life's work actually entails. His brother as a games designer and Ruben as an author. So Ruben's question pertains to age and time. He says, my brother is the pessimist in this discussion, believing that maybe your 30s is too late to start these sort of endeavours. And I'm the optimist, stubbornly believing it's never too late. How would you weigh into that sort of argument? Oh, babe, talk to anyone over 50. <laughs> We're like, it's not, you're the one that's right, Ruben. Tell your brother that you're right. Yes, 30s is not too late for anything. Things are only just beginning now. There's plenty of examples throughout history of, people achieving and doing their best work in their 40s. I think Maya Angelou didn't start publishing stuff until she was in her 40s. Frank McCourt, these are all authors. Maybe they're like the only examples I have, but Frank McCourt wrote his first book, Angel's Ashes, and it was published when he was in his 40s. Um, I actually just finished an, uh, a couple of books by an author called Diana Athill, who I love. And she was an editor in England. She's dead now. 
She got famous in her 70s when she started publishing her books. Those are all examples from books and authors, but no, it's never, it's, I don't think it's ever too late to take on something new in your life or find new direction or find something new to do or build a life. And your 30s is definitely not too late for any of that stuff to start. Yeah, um, that was probably a question that I had that you kind of answered is um, I'm 25 and a lot of my friends kind of see your 20s as uh, there's almost this elusive timeline where you've got to get all these checkpoints done before age 30. Um, oh my God, you have very industrious friends. <laughs> oh, I know. But and I think particularly with women, also the, the thought of a biological clock comes into it as well. And I just wondered, did you experience the pressure of this elusive timeline as well? Or do you think it still exists or are we starting to reject it more? Oh, no, I think we're very bad at rejecting it. It definitely mm. still, it'd be good if we started to reject it more, but it definitely still exists. Um, you know, I probably wouldn't admit it, wouldn't have admitted it at the time, but I think I probably did have a series of checklists in my 20s that I wanted to tick off before I was 30. Uh, the main one, I think, was probably writing a book, but lots of other things happened for me in that time. But I also felt like in my 20s, life was just something that happened to me. Like any opportunity... That came along I would say yes to I didn't have any grand plan I actually probably didn't have that much of a checklist I didn't have a grand plan I just said yes to everything that came along and um and worked really hard but you should you know I hate you a little bit you're 25 and you think time's running out already <laughs> <laughs> you have, you've got nothing but time you're gonna be fine <laughs> but um I think but it's a very normal normal feeling I think yeah have and and to stress about but you should just try and like go of it a bit and enjoy it you know I did a lot of time wasting in my 20s as well and had so much fun so yeah don't feel you have to be head down but oh, I'm the queen of wasting time I feel like I'm actively rejecting that elusive timeline that I was talking about but I just think sometimes just sits in the back of your mind and will rear its ugly head every now and then and I said no I, I need to look at more memes I'm not ready to start <laughs> thinking about <laughs> real life stuff <laughs> um anyway we have officially gone over time thank you everyone for sending through your questions Kat did you have any finishing words I suppose um all I would like to say is uh how great it is to see everyone turning out to support someone who I have been a huge fan of for quite a few years now almost more years than I care to count and I can't wait for the next book Bridie, uh, thank you for giving us all some insight and guidance and more than anything, reassurance. That's definitely what I felt when I got to the end of the book. So thank you so much, Bridie Jabor. Congratulations and well done. You know what? I'm going to thank you. unmute everyone and we can give you a little yeah. round of applause. One <laughs> second. All right, I've asked everyone to unmute. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, thank you everyone for joining again. Remember you can purchase Trivial Grievance Grievances at Avid Reader or please support a local New South Wales bookstore as they continue through a very, very difficult lockdown. All right. Thanks, Kat. Thanks, Friday. Bye. Thanks, Kat. Bye. Bye.